Welcome, I'm Richard D. Hall and I'm here in Portugal, Praia de Luz. Now the reason why I've come here is because I'm making a series of documentaries about the Madeleine McCann case. Why am I making programs about that? Well, it's because I'm sick and tired of misleading media headlines about the incident. In these films, I will expose the hard facts about the incident and also what has happened since the incident. The documentaries clearly show the last place to get truthful information from is mainstream media. And I will also expose those who are controlling mainstream media. Madeleine McCann, the three-year-old British girl abducted from her bed by a stranger between 9pm and 10pm on Thursday the 3rd of May 2007. It's become one of the most enduring mysteries of our time. Even the McCann's ever-present spokesman, Clarence Mitchell, whom we'll hear quite a bit more about in this documentary, admitted back in 2011 that her disappearance remained, quote, a complete mystery. Under British law, a person who has been missing for seven years or more may be declared dead. A coroner's court has the power, upon application by a relative or other interested person, to declare that a missing person is to be treated as deceased. The McCanns raised millions of pounds to search for Madeleine. The McCanns have spent millions on a series of private detective agencies. The McCanns have spent many more millions on a series of public relations advisers and lawyers. After all this, it seems we are not an inch further forward in terms of knowing how Madeleine disappeared and what may have happened to her. It's a story that has sold millions of extra tabloid newspapers and to this day deeply divides people, even within a family. In one corner, so to speak, are the McCanns, their fleet of public relations experts and lawyers and Scotland Yard, whose review and investigation has already lasted nearly three years and cost around £7 million. Their position is clear. Madeline was abducted from her bed by a stranger. The Portuguese investigation was bungled and wrongly framed them, and the Portuguese Attorney General has cleared them. They are all continuing the search for Madeline, whether she is alive or dead. But the McCanns face an array of opposition. The Portuguese detective who investigated Madeline's disappearance pulled the McCanns in for questioning and made them suspects in their own daughter's disappearance. He wrote a book on the case pointedly titled The Truth of the Lie. He claimed that the evidence suggested that Madeline had died in her parents' apartment and that the McCanns arranged to hide her body and falsely claimed that she was abducted. Many agree with him, not least former detective John Stoker, who led the inquiry into the Royal Ulster Constabulary's controversial shoot-to-kill policy. Way back in 2007, he declared, the McCanns are hiding a big secret. One of my fascinations about this case is why the mainstream media are so reluctant to discuss the details. On TV, their account of events is rarely challenged in depth. They are, in effect, given a platform, despite the nagging questions that remain. In this series of documentaries, we'll be examining the facts in greater detail than has ever been done on film. The material will inevitably raise questions in your minds, and that's what it's meant to do. My purpose is to shed some penetrating light into dark secret of areas that the mainstream media dare not touch. In part one and two, we're going to examine the two main areas of evidence that led to the McCanns being pulled in for questioning. First of all, some of the changes of story and the contradictions. Secondly, the intelligence provided by two police dogs trained by world sniffer dog expert Mr. Martin Grime, who now works for the FBI. Next, we'll have a look at the controversial record of the detective agencies employed by the McCanns. And finally, we'll probe the extraordinary amount of top-level help the McCanns have had from the British government and its intelligence agencies. In part two, we will pick up some of these issues in greater detail, focusing on the many changes of story and contradictions in the case, seeking to analyse and explain why there are so many. 
So let's start by a brief look at one key change of story over how the abductor is said to have gained access to the apartment and one major contradiction, the conflicting accounts of a visit said to have been paid by the McCann's friend, Dr. David Payne, to Kate McCann around 6.30 p.m. on the day Madeline was reported missing. So what was the original story that the McCann's gave to the press? Let's recall that it was an international story that developed with breakneck speed. According to the McCanns, Madeline was first discovered missing around 10 p.m. on Thursday the 3rd of May 2007. Half an hour to an hour later, they reported this to the Ocean Club reception, who in turn called in the police. By around 7 a.m. the following morning, just nine hours later, British news media were already reporting this mysterious disappearance. Some of them were briefed directly by friends of the McCanns, such as Jill Renwick, a friend of former Prime Minister Gordon Brown and his wife. During the early hours of Friday morning, the British print media summoned their overseas reporters to the Portuguese village of Praia de Luz, like John Clark, the editor of the expat Spanish newspaper, The Olive Press, who files reports for The Sun and The Daily Mail. He was summoned in the early hours of Friday morning and made a five-hour journey from his home in Ronda, Spain, to be in Praia de Luz before noon that day. It was an international media frenzy from day one. One of these early reports was carried by the BBC, who carried the comments of Trish Cameron, sister of Jerry McCann. The BBC reported that Mrs Cameron had received a telephone call from her 39-year-old brother, a consultant cardiologist, who was hysterical and crying his eyes out, she said. The last check at half past nine, they were all sound asleep, sleeping, windows shut, shutters shut. Kate went back at 10 o'clock to check. The front door was lying open. The window had been tampered with. The shutters had been jammed open or whatever you call it. And Madeline was missing. There is no doubt whatsoever that this was the story the McCanns wanted the press to report. An abductor, they claimed, had broken through the windows and shutters using a jemmy and had taken Madeline from their holiday apartment. The Guardian carried the following account of Kate McCann's father, Brian Healy. Jerry told me that when they went back, the shutters to the room were broken, they were jemmied up, and she was gone. The Mirror and the Times both carried a report from Madeline's godfather, filmmaker John Corner, who said that Kate McCann had phoned him in the middle of the night. He said she just blurted out that Madeline had been abducted. Kate said the shutters of the room were smashed, Madeline was missing. It looks as though someone has gone straight past the twins to get her. A family friend, Jill Renwick, told GMTV and The Independent that they were just watching the hotel room and going back every half hour and the shutters had been broken open and they had gone into the room and taken Madeline. So the McCanns then gave this account to four separate people. The nation was told first that there had been a violent break-in with the shutters being forced open with a jemmy. Second, that the front door had been locked but was now lying open and third, of course, that Madeline had been taken. But within just 24 hours, the McCann's initial accounts dramatically changed in several important aspects. I'll explain how they changed. We'll first of all examine Jerry McCann's first witness statement, made the very next day, Friday the 4th of May. He says that during the evening, both he and his wife checked on the children using a key to open the front door of their apartment. He explained how his wife Kate found Madeline missing on her 10 p.m. check and how he then rushed to the apartment and found the windows to the children's room open, the shutters raised and the curtains drawn open. There is now no mention of the front door lying open. Kate, who of course was the one to raise the alarm and therefore entered the apartment before Jerry, says exactly the same about the children's room. The window open, the shutters raised and the curtains open. She adds that she is certain they were all closed when they left at 8.30pm that evening to dine at the Tapas restaurant. An interesting point to note is that although Jerry was interviewed alone by the police, Jerry and his advisers persuaded the police for him to sit behind Kate whilst she was being interviewed. An unusual concession. On page 91 of her book on the case called Madeline, she writes that Jerry would place a hand on my shoulder from time to time or give me a reassuring squeeze. But the entire claim of an open window, of a raised and jemmied shutter, and of curtains wide open was blown apart hours after Jerry and Kate made their statements. 
The Independent, for example, quoted John Hill, the manager of the Ocean Club in Pride de Luz, as saying, Despite the report by a family friend that the shutters of the couple's apartment were broken, there was no sign that anyone had forced their way in while the McCanns ate at the tapas restaurant. It's still questionable whether it's an abduction. Later, Chief Inspector Oligario Sousa, the spokesman for the investigation, told British police officer Detective Inspector Kirby that the windows and the shutter had not been tampered with, adding that their mechanism makes them almost impossible to open from the outside. Later, pictures of the police examining the shutters were made available for the public to see. It was very clear that the shutters were not damaged. There was no support for the claims made by Jerry and Kate just hours after Madeline was reported missing that the shutters had been jemmied open. An even more dramatic change of story was to follow when the McCanns were asked to give second statements to the police on the 10th of May, six days later. Despite Jerry having clearly told police that during that evening they had on each occasion checked on the children, gone to the front door and used a key to get in, now they maintained that this was untrue. Instead, they claimed they left through the patio door, leaving it unlocked. Their claim of a violent break-in by an abductor through the children's bedroom had been proved to be false. Now they had to rapidly explain how the supposed abductor got into the apartment in the first place. We can see what Jerry now said in his second, much longer statement. The police report notes, Despite what he said in his previous statements, he states now, and with certainty, that he left with Kate through the back door, the patio door, which he closed but did not lock, given that it is only possible to lock it from the inside. For good measure, Jerry now added that he was certain that he had closed the front door, but maintained that, quote, it was unlikely that it was locked. It was to be the TV documentary Searching for Madeline by Dispatches on the 18th of October 2007 that was to bring about a formal admission by Jerry and Kate McCann and their spokesman that the abductor could not have entered the premises via the window to the children's room. The programme effectively proved that there was no way anybody could break into the apartment and leave no forensic trace nor damage to the lightweight aluminium shutters, which are covered with a fine coating of polyurethane paint which marks very easily. David Barclay, the former head of physical evidence at the UK National Crime Operations Faculty, was quoted in the programme. He said, We must be very careful that we're not saying this is actually staging, but it's difficult to see how anybody could have interfered with those shutters from outside without leaving some trace. In fact, having looked at them, I think it's almost impossible. Shortly after this program, which was highly sceptical of the McCann's version of events, their spokesman Clarence Mitchell made a remarkable statement, which I'll reproduce in full below, exactly as quoted in The Independent. The Independent article told its readers, the spokesman for the family of Madeleine McCann has reversed a statement made in the early days of the search for the missing child. In the early part of the hunt, friends and family members told journalists that the shutters in the apartment where the McCanns were staying had been broken. Then they quoted Mitchell, there was no evidence of a break-in. I'm not going into detail, but I can say that Kate and Jerry are firmly of the view that somebody got into the apartment and took Madeleine out of the window as their means of escape. And to do that, they did not necessarily have to tamper with anything. They got out of the window fairly easily. The McCanns had already asked us to believe that they had made a genuine error when they initially told police that they were entering the apartment by the front door. Now they were making a claim that many people found difficult to swallow. They now boldly suggested, via their spokesman, that the mystery abductor had calmly walked through an unlocked patio door. He is then supposed to have picked up Madeline from her bed and, as their spokesman said, taken her out of the window as his means of escape. On top of that, no one, apart from one of the McCann's close friends who was with them on holiday, saw any abductor, nor heard any abductor. If there really had been an abductor taking a child through the children's window, he left no forensic trace behind. The window in the children's room was quite small, about 2 foot 6 by 2 foot 6. It is hard to see how an abductor could have got through the window with a child without waking that child up. 
More to the point, why would the mystery abductor choose to climb through the window when he already knew he could simply walk out of either the unlocked patio door or the unlocked front door? The McCanns now had a further problem. How could they explain an abductor freely entering their apartment through a door and then deciding to climb with the child through a small window? Eventually the McCanns found an explanation, though this latest explanation proved to be even more bizarre than previous ones. In 2010 the McCanns were involved in a three-day libel trial in Portugal. This was a claim they had made against the author and publishers of a book about the case by Chief Detective Inspector Dr. Gonçal Amaral, who coordinated the initial investigation into Madeleine's disappearance. Some evidence was given during that trial which seriously embarrassed them. Dealing with the opened window and shutters, Kate McCann told the media on the 14th of January, As for the window, I described to the police officers exactly what I found that night as it was and is highly relevant. I knew that every little detail could be helpful in finding my daughter. The window, which is a ground floor window, was completely open and is large enough for a person to easily climb through it. Whether it had been opened for this purpose remains unknown. It could of course have been opened by the perpetrator when inside the apartment as a potential escape route or left open as a red herring. The McCanns seriously proposed that an abductor might have walked in through one of two unlocked doors in the property and either opened the windows and shutters of the children's room as a third potential escape route or, even more bizarrely, opened them just to confuse any investigators. If anything, Kate's book Madeline came up with an even more ridiculous scenario on page 131. She wrote, Perhaps the abductor had either come in or gone out via the window, not both. Perhaps he hadn't been through it at all, but had opened it to prepare an emergency escape route if needed, or merely to throw investigators off the scent. He could have been in and out of the apartment more than once between our visits. What we do now believe is that the abductor had very probably been into the room before Jerry's check. All these scenarios are, to say the least, highly improbable. In a moment I'll finish off this section on the initial changes of story by having a detailed look at the claims made by Kate McCann about what she saw and did when she entered the apartment that night and says she found Madeline gone. But first, I have mentioned the McCann's spokesman, Clarence Mitchell, once or twice. I hope to say much more about both him and the government's role in helping the McCann's on a future occasion. But for now, let me say a few pertinent things about him. At the time that Madeline was reported missing, Mitchell was head of the Blair government's powerful media machine, the Media Monitoring Unit, inside the Central Office of Information, known by many as the Central Office for Disinformation. On a salary, in today's terms, of over £100,000, he headed up a 40-strong media manipulation department that was costing taxpayers several millions of pounds a year. After he had been working for the McCanns for a year, he boasted to a Portuguese newspaper, L'Espresso, that his job was to control what comes out in the media. Before becoming the McCann spokesman, he had worked for the BBC for many years on some of the top crime stories of the time. The murders by Fred and Rosemary West, the Sower murders of Jessica Chapman and Holly Wells, and Jill Dando's murder, to name but three. Why was it that the highly paid boss of Tony Blair's feared media unit, reporting directly to the Cabinet Office at 10 Downing Street, was put in charge of handling the media storm around Madeleine McCann on the 6th of May 2007, just three days after Madeleine was reported missing? What was it that made the British government, just 16 days after that, transfer him to the Foreign Office and order him out to Praia de Luz in Portugal, where he stayed until the McCanns dashed home to England after the Portuguese police made them both formal suspects in the disappearance of Madeleine? That month, September 2007, Clarence Mitchell was allowed to leave his highly paid civil service post in order to work full time for the McCanns. For a year after that, he was at the centre of story after story about Madeleine that appeared on the front pages of British tabloids. Many of them were stories apparently manufactured by Mitchell. There was one tale after another, and talk of suspects, persons of interest, and people we want to trace to eliminate from our inquiries, accompanied by lurid artist sketches of a variety of people claimed to have been lurking around the holiday village of Pride de Luz around the time the McCanns were there. 
nothing came of all these media stories as we know. But Mitchell succeeded in his aim of keeping the idea that Madeleine was abducted and may still be alive in the forefront of people's minds. But what Mitchell has done after he stopped working full time for the McCanns in September 2008 is also very interesting. He carried on working part time for the McCanns on a retainer said to be worth £30,000 a year but immediately obtained a job working as a reputation manager at Freud International. That company is owned and run by Matthew Freud, the son-in-law of media mogul Rupert Murdoch. It was becoming clear that Mitchell was closely connected to the Murdoch empire. In 2009, David Cameron famously met Rupert Murdoch on Murdoch's yacht in the Mediterranean. He was flown there in Matthew Freud's private jet. Weeks after that historic meeting, Murdoch, having for years told his newspapers like The Sun and The Times to back Labour, now dramatically switched sides and began backing Cameron's Conservatives to win the 2010 general election, which they did, though not obtaining an overall majority. At around the same time, Cameron appointed Andy Coulson, former editor of the News of the World, another Murdoch newspaper, as his director of communications. Coulson, of course, has been embroiled in the long-running phone-hacking trial at the Old Bailey, accused of illegally paying high-ranking police officers for juicy stories and illegally hacking people's phones. In March 2010, Cameron and Coulson appointed Mitchell as their Deputy Director of Communications to help master the control of the media to win the general election for the Conservatives. So there we had a team made up of Cameron, a close personal friend and neighbour of Rebecca Brooks, then the Chief Executive Officer of Murdoch's News International Empire, Coulson, former editor of one of Murdoch's newspapers, and Clarence Mitchell, Chief Media Spinner for Blair, and a recent highly paid public relations consultant to the company owned and run by Murdoch's son-in-law. Mitchell was a man, therefore, who moved in the very highest echelons of the British political and media establishment. Just why was it necessary for him to be given a full-time job as public relations officer for the McCanns just three days after Madeleine went missing? After all, as far as anyone knew at the time, Madeleine could have been found any day. And has Mitchell's expensive input in the case, costing hundreds of thousands of pounds over the past seven years, found out anything useful about what really happened to Madeleine? The answer to that, so far, is no. But let's return to the specific subject matter in hand, the changes of story by the McCanns in their initial statements to the Portuguese police. Let's probe this a little deeper. In her May 2009 interview, Kate McCann gave her first detailed description of what she found when she checked on the children at around 10pm on the 3rd of May 2007. Among other things, she mentions what she says is Madeline's favourite toy, a pink soft toy called Cuddle Cat. Here's what Kate McCann said. I did my check about 10 o'clock and went in through the sliding patio doors and I just stood actually and I thought, oh, all quiet. And to be honest, I might have been tempted to turn round then, but I just noticed that the door, the bedroom door where the three children were sleeping, was open much further than we'd left it. I went to close it to about here and then as I got to here, it suddenly <laughs> slammed. And then as I opened it, it was then that I just thought, I'll just look at the children. And I could see Sean and Emily in the cot. And then I was looking at Madeline's bed, which is here, and it was dark. And I was looking and I was thinking, is that, is that Madeline or is that the bedding? And I, I couldn't quite make her out. And it, it sounds really stupid now, but at the time I was thinking I didn't want to put the light on because I didn't want to wake them. And literally, as I went back in, the curtains of the bedroom, which were drawn, which were closed, whoosh, it was like a gust of wind, kind of just blew them open. And Cuddle Cat was still there, and a pink blanket was still there. I mean, I knew straight away that she'd uh, been taken, you know. Looking at this in more detail, first of all, she says that the door was further open than we left it. She means further open than when we left the children at 8.30pm to go down to dinner. The statement is complete nonsense for this reason. Kate may have remembered, so she says, leaving the door slightly open when they left for the restaurant at 8.30pm. But we know, according to their statements, 
that two other people had been in the apartment in the meantime, her husband Jerry just after 9pm and their friend Dr Matthew Oldfield, so she would have no way of knowing how open these two had left the door to the children's room. The curtains were closed when they left them, she says. Then a gust of wind is said to have blown the curtains into the room, but photographs released by the Portuguese show one of the two curtains trapped against the wall down the side of a bed below the window. The other is seen behind a wicker chair. That is one sign that the curtains must have been arranged by someone in that position. Moreover, curtains that blow in the wind do not suddenly end up two or three feet apart, as we can see in the police photograph. They are folded, which means that someone has actually drawn them back. The right-hand curtain is more drawn back than the left. It was not a gust of wind which did this. With all these changes of story and contradictions, it is hardly surprising that the Portuguese police questioned the McCann's account very early on. We saw earlier that both of the McCann's reported that on arrival to their apartment at around 10pm, the shutter was raised and the windows were open. The window, by the way, is a sliding window. You open the catch and then one window slides in front of the other. If the abductor had really used the window as his means of exit, it would have been a very tight squeeze indeed to get through. But what this also means is that if there really had been a gust of wind, as the McCanns claimed, it would have blown one of the curtains. It is a further indication that the alleged crime scene was arranged. Furthermore, when the police examined the window frame for fingerprints, they only found one fingerprint. It was the fingerprint of Kate McCann. Let's examine one or two more aspects of the claims made by the McCanns about the state of the children's room when they found it that night. They first of all told police that the door to the children's room was completely open, but when Kate McCann was interviewed about this on TV, this changed to the door was left open a bit more than we had left it. As we discussed above, this statement was nonsense, as two other people had allegedly checked on the children during the evening so the McCanns wouldn't know how open the door had been left anyway. In her book on the case, Madeline, Kate says the door was open quite wide. In her May 2009 interview, Kate McCann said this about the door allegedly slamming shut because of a gust of wind. The bedroom door where the three children were sleeping was open much further than we'd left it. I went to close it to about here, and then as I got to here, it suddenly slammed and then as I opened it it was then that I just thought I'll just look at the children. This is how she told the story to CNN. And I just noticed that the the door to the children's bedroom was quite far open and we always leave it just so it's slightly ajar just to let a little bit of light in and I thought to myself um, did Matt leave the door open at half nine because uh, Matt checked on them at half nine um, and I thought that must be what happened. So I went to, to close over the children's door and just as I was about to close it, it kind of slammed as if like a gust of wind had shut it. The same story is in her book on page 71. Then I noticed that the door to the children's bedroom was open quite wide, not how we had left it. At first I assumed that Matt must have moved it. I walked over and gently began to pull it too. Suddenly it slammed shut as if caught by a draught. We notice here first a bit of clever backfitting. The nonsense about the door being open wider than when we left it is changed. Now, she states, at first I assumed that Matt, a doctor friend of theirs, had moved it. It has taken her four years to add this bit to her story. A vital point to notice here is that the claims about the gust of wind and the door slamming shut were never in any of the McCann's original statements. These claims were added by them months later. This story of the alleged gust of wind, the curtains whooshing wide open and the door slamming shut, then featured heavily in a documentary shown by Channel 4 in May 2009, and in subsequent reconstructions, documentaries and TV interviews. The photographs taken by the Portuguese police show clearly that the curtains are hanging down and held firmly, one trapped down the side of the bed against the wall and the other behind the wicker chair. The folds in each curtain are clearly flattened against the wall of the furniture. This could not have happened due to an alleged gust of wind. The curtains have every appearance of having been deliberately arranged in that position and that is exactly what the original Portuguese police investigators decided. They said the alleged crime scene had been faked.
Now let's have a look at Kate McCann's first police statement, made on Friday the 4th of May, the day after Madeline was reported missing. The police statement says that she went into the apartment by the side door, which was closed but unlocked, and immediately noticed that the door to her children's bedroom was completely open. The window was also open, the shutters raised, and the curtains open, while she was certain of having closed them all, as she always did. But the photos of the children's room taken when the police arrive show the windows closed. They are the type that lock together automatically when closed and need a finger inserted into the black mechanism in the centre to release the catch. They also show the shutters in the almost closed position. The photos also show the curtains half closed, the left curtain slightly more closed than the right one. We can immediately see how this conflicts with Kate's claims that the shutters, window and curtains were all completely open. In Jerry's second statement, made on the 10th of May, he describes he found the window was open to one side, the shutters almost fully raised and the curtains drawn back. Again we can see how Jerry's claim that the shutters, window and curtains were all completely open conflicts with the state of these items when the Portuguese police arrive. On the 6th of September 2007, the day before she was declared a formal suspect by the Portuguese police, Kate answered police questions until the moment the police told her that they now wanted to ask her in detail about the events of the 3rd of May. At this point, Kate McCann immediately exercised her legal right to remain silent and said nothing more of evidential interest. So summarising, in the McCann's original statements the curtains were described by them as drawn back or fully open, but in the police photos they are only half drawn. In addition, as we've seen, the window is a sliding window, so only one half can be open, that window pane sliding in front of the other. A gust of wind would therefore disturb only one curtain, not both. Now let us examine the story around the children's bedroom door. In her police statement on the 4th of May, which was later confirmed by Jerry, Kate McCann says the children's bedroom door was completely open. But months later, they tell a very different story to journalists. Now it is, the door was open a bit more than we had left it. It's of interest to note that if we take these words at their face value, Kate is basically saying that she did not intend to look into the children's room until she says she noticed the door wider open than they had left it. It is hardly surprising when we consider this scene that the original Portuguese investigating team thought there were obvious signs that the scene in the children's room had been faked. If we look at the police photos, we see first of all that the bed Madeline is said to have slept in looks neat and tidy, with the corner neatly turned down. It does not immediately look like a bed that has been slept in, or one from which a child has been suddenly snatched. If we look at the curtains, it looks as though someone has tucked the curtains back down the crack between the bed and the wall, having first moved out the bed, arranged the curtains in position, and then pushing the bed back against the curtain. Moreover, although Kate claims that the curtains whooshed open and were drawn back, in the photos they clearly are not. Neither the whooshing of the wind nor the slamming of the door was originally reported by either Kate or Jerry McCann. Why was it that these claims were only raised in 2009, nearly two years after Madeline was reported missing? Finally, what was the weather like that night? Were there so-called gusts of wind, as Kate McCann claimed? It seems highly unlikely. We've had a look at the available weather records for that night. It was a cool night with a light breeze. At nearby Faro Airport, the maximum wind speed was a light force 3. At 10pm, Faro Airport recorded a wind speed of just 9 miles per hour. It hardly seems strong enough to cause a door to slam or to whoosh open a curtain which is found trapped behind a bed. There is one other very curious aspect about the weather that night. Several of the McCann's friends commented on how cool or cold it was. In fact, at about 9pm to 10pm, when the supposed abduction is claimed to have happened, the outside temperature was around 13 degrees centigrade. That's 55 in Fahrenheit. You would need warm clothing when outside. One of their friends, Jane Tanner, specifically commented on how cold it was and how she needed to wear a coat when going out, so she said, to check on her two children. Yet bizarrely, Jerry McCann in his statements claims it was a hot night. 
In a moment we'll check on some statements made about the weather that night, but first let's examine yet another contradiction in this case so full of changes of story and contradictions. In her book, Kate McCann describes how she and Jerry left the children when they sauntered down to the tapas bar to meet their friends. I took them all into their bedroom. Madeline got into her bed and then Emily Sean and I settled ourselves on top of it with our backs against the wall for our final story. Then we kissed the twins and kissed Madeline, who was already snuggled down with her princess blanket and cuddle cat, a soft toy she'd been given soon after she was born and never went to bed without. Snuggles down clearly conjures up an image of a child tucked up under her sheets and blankets, feeling all warm and cosy. You snuggle into or under something. But just a page further on in the book, Kate writes, Jerry left to do the first check just before 9.05 by his watch. He found Madeline lying there on her left-hand side, her legs under the covers, in exactly the same position as we'd left her. So when they left, Madeline had already, quote, snuggled down. That is how they left her. Jerry now says he found her, quote, in exactly the same position as we'd left her. But what does Jerry say? Now Madeline is reported to be on top of the bed with only her legs covered up. Lying on top of the bed with her legs under the covers cannot possibly be described as snuggled down. Even more bizarrely, if we now return to Jerry McCann's second statement to the police, made on the 10th of May 2007, Concerning the bed where his daughter was on the night she disappeared, he says that she slept uncovered, as usual when it was hot with the bedclothes folded down. So even days after Madeline was reported missing, he tells the Portuguese police that Madeline slept on top of the bed because it was so hot, yet when Kate McCann published her book four years later, we are told that she was snuggled down in her bed when they left the children and headed out for their evening at the tapas bar. We've seen that the temperature around 8 to 9 p.m. that night was around 13 degrees centigrade. What other remarks did the McCanns and their friends make about the weather that night? On page 73 of her book, it was so cold and so windy. Now their friend Jane Tanner, referring to the person carrying a child, she says she saw that night. I just thought that child's not got any shoes on, you could see the feet and, I just, and it was quite a cold night in Portugal in May, it's not actually that warm and I'd got a big jumper on and um, I remember thinking, oh that parent's not a particularly good parent, they've not wrapped them up. It was actually quite cold. In April 2008, Jane Tanner was re-interviewed in England by Leicestershire Police. In that interview she was again asked about the weather that night. She said, yeah and there were some people inside because it was quite chilly, it was actually quite quite cold. I remember I was wearing, because it was cold, I'd got Russell's big jumper on, cropped trousers and flip-flops, and yeah, it was quite, you know, sort of cold. I thought that the child might be cold. That's one reason why we didn't open the shutters, to open the window or anything in that room. It wasn't actually really hot at all. It was actually quite cloudy in the days, and at night it was actually quite chilly. If there was any doubt about how cold it was that night, and indeed the rest of the week, the McCann's friend, Dr. Russell O'Brien, said the nights were quite chilly. Another friend, Dr. Matthew Oldfield, said in the evenings it was very cold. His wife, Rachel Oldfield, said it was really cold in the evenings. Another friend, Dr. David Payne, said it was quite cold some nights and, you know, perhaps nearly too cold to be sat outside. Then look at his wife, Fiona Payne's statement. It was still very cold. Fiona Payne's mother, grandmother Diana Webster, also went on holiday with the tapas group and noted that when the children were brought up to our apartment, they would have to come out into the cold. So why, alone amongst his group of friends, does Jerry McCann insist it was so hot that Madeline lay on top of her bedclothes that night? Could it be because the police photographs shows a bed which shows few signs of having been slept in during the evening of the 3rd of May? Is that something he was perhaps struggling to explain? When Kate McCann was pulled in for questioning on the 7th of September 2007, just four months after Madeline had been reported missing, the first question she was asked was this. On the 3rd of May 2007, at around 10pm when you entered the apartment, what did you see? What did you do? Where did you search? What did you handle? She had a golden opportunity to tell the police what she saw and what she did but instead she exercised her right not to comment. 
She was asked forty-seven more questions. She answered no comment to every one. The last question she was asked was, Are you aware of the fact by not answering these questions you may compromise the investigation which is trying to find out what happened to your daughter? Kate McCann did answer that one. She replied, Yes, if that is what the investigation thinks. After this unproductive interview, the Portuguese police made Kate and Arguida suspect in English. Three days after that interview, Dr. Conchalo Amaral's chief inspector, Tavares de Almeida, published a detailed interim report. It didn't pull any punches. This report was very clear in suggesting that Madeleine McCann had died in her parents' apartment and that the parents had covered up the truth and that they had conspired to hide the body. Writing of the alleged crime scene, he pronounced, There is strong evidence that the crime scene was altered and some furniture was moved around. Those changes are indications that the abduction was a stage-managed simulation. He also had something to say about the constant changes of story, contradictions and backfitting. In a section headed, The McCanns Evolved Their Story to Adapt to the Police Questions, he wrote, The media attention that has been given to the case and the search for information by the said media has led to an evolution of Madeleine's parents' statements. All the information that has been made public has contributed to the McCanns rebuilding and adapting their story to fit the eventual police questions. They have attempted to explain the forensic evidence that we have collected and are collecting. We had very clear objectives what we wanted and any parents would take the opportunity of trying to get information into the investigation. That there is no evidence that Madeline is dead and there's no evidence to implicate us in her death. Everything we have done during the last hundred days is focused on uh, the belief that Madeline was alive when she was abducted. That evening, did you give to your kids something like cobalt to help them sleep? You know, we're not going to comment on anything, but you know, there is absolutely no way we used any sedative drugs or anything like that. How do you feel now that um, Amaral's book is, is, is going to be in the shelves here? Yeah, so, well, you know, as we've already alluded to, anyone who wants to convince people that Madeline is dead without evidence to support it, their motives have to be questioned. Can you update people? Where are you now? Have you got any new leads? What's happening with your investigation? Well, I mean, I'd like to say to you that we did have some hot leads, but I mean... Cuando vosotros os enteráis de eso, de que la policía ha descubierto sangre en el apartamento, ¿cómo reaccionáis? You know what? <laughs> this is all investigation. In the next film, we will be looking at more contradictions and also the evidence of two sniffer dogs.